So, welcome back to my let's play of Aurora 4X, Dwarf Fortress in Space, as it's sometimes called, um, where we left off last time. We had just had a construction on uh, two of our explorer ships. Um, what we're going to do now is... Um, now, when we created the game, because we're starting Trans-Newtonian, uh, let me just put your time space master back on. Um, what we have is we have some points for ships and defense centers um, that we could have potentially built between um, a, a standard um, start and a uh, by the time we got the, the tech. So basically, we get a little bit of a head start um, in terms of build points. So what we're going to do is we're going to use those build points to create a few ships that you can reasonably expect uh, civilization to have built as part of uh, the start of its spacefaring. So what we are going to build is we are going to build a freighter and we're going to plop it into the game using the uh, fast OB creation uh, portion of Space Master mode. So we're just going to go and set this as a freighter. There we are. Now, this whole thing is purely cosmetic. The only effect it has is that you can see it and it makes sorting ships uh, and classes easier. Because each individual ship can have its own individual name, um, which you can pre-select through this drop-down, um, you need some way to remember, because you're not going to remember a hundred different names, especially once you start getting into fighters and stuff like that. And having ships ships be called Sydney 1, Sydney 2, Sydney 3, and so forth, can get boring. So, hull, hull type, purely cosmetic, but lets you know what is what. Uh, now, we're going to use conscript crews, because we don't want to be consuming our precious, um, highly skilled military crew. Um, and a freighter doesn't really care about morale, so conscript crews it is. <clears throat> so, what we need is an ion drive, and we are going to add a cargo hold. A standard cargo hold holds 25,000 tons, which is enough for most uh, facilities. Um, I'll cover which ones can fit in what uh, in a moment, but 25,000 is usually good enough. So, a 25,000 cargo hold is, well, 25,000 tons. So, we are going to need um, a little bit of extra engine power. Um, with speed, it's basically your engine power divided by your ship size in hull sizes um, times 1,000 kilometers per second. So, 300, 600 gets about 500. There you go. So, if we double our power, we get close to 1,000, triple it, we get to 1,300, uh, quadruple it, we get up to 1,650-50. So, uh, 1,655. So, that's reasonable for a freighter. Now, there is, very important, very important, this is the load time. This is how long it takes for your freighter, or anything that, that can hold cargo, to load or unload whatever it's picking up or dropping off. Um, so this is days, hours, minutes, days, hours, minutes, which is 10 days and 10 hours. So obviously, that is a very, very, very long time to spend sitting around loading and unloading. And having more cargo hold will increase that again. So if we have, so 50,000 tons takes 20 days. That's ridiculous. So what we do is we take a cargo handling system. Cargo handling systems take their rating and reduce the loading time by that rate. I believe they're divided by the total rating. So cargo handling multiplier is 5. Divided by 5, you get 2. If we add a second one, you divide it by 10 and you get 1. 10 days, 10, 10 days, 10 hours gets uh, one day, one hour. If we add a third one, it drops down to 16 hours. That's pretty reasonable. It's still got a nice speed, and it's 36,500 tons. So 
It's big, but still workable. Uh, 4.6 billion kilometers is not very much, though, so we're just going to stick give it a little bit of extra fuel. 30 billion, uh, almost 30 billion, that's nice. 300,000 liters, that's pretty good. Uh, it doesn't need any armor. Deployment time of 12 is usually good enough. It doesn't have 12 days of power. And an interesting thing is that with freighters, this part is important, but this part is also important uh, because a freighter is pretty much always going to be sitting um, on top of a colony, right? It's loading and unloading, and it's not really going to be sitting out in open space. It there is no reason for it to do so. So when it comes to freighters, it's one of the few things where this is important. So a, one year in Aurora is exactly 360 days, and this freighter has about 200 days worth of fuel. So the deployment time of 12 months is more than enough um, to cover its deployment. Um, the only exceptions are, of course, that uh, if it has to go out and back, out and refuel and back, um, sometimes it may uh, not be able to um, get back in time. But at the end of the day, the deployment time is irrelevant because it really doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't have any statistics or anything like that um, that would um, that would be affected by morale. <clears throat> Alright. So that is our freighter. Uh, we'll get a fuel tanker up as well in uh, eventually, but we don't need one just yet. So, let's go and spawn ourselves a fighter. So, camera is already visible. Uh, we want... We actually don't want the camera. We want... Let's reload that. We want the Sydney. Okay. And we are going to put it in the cargo task group. So, that's the points that we'll shave off. We'll add a freighter. There we are. Now, what else do we need? We need a planetary defense ship, but we don't have any weapons, so that's not going to be too useful for us. We could... Do we have a freighter component? <clears throat> I don't think we have one yet. No, we do not. I'll keep this as a junk ship for now. So leave that one alone. Let's just wait for uh, some more technology to come through and for these. So, uh, in the last episode, uh, if you remember, uh, this camera, the Mark Aronson, um, is being produced purely by the shipyard itself. The, jo the George, on the other hand, um, had its engine and jump drive uh, rebuilt independently by industry. So, if we jump five days, you'll see that the George will very quickly catch up and outpace the engines are complete and outpace the construction of the Mark Aronson. Construction is continued on from the engines, that's fine. Almost, and there we are. There you go, see? Now it's taken over, and it's going to finish uh, the about six months gap between them. <clears throat> that's what we got. Boat bay, that's what we're looking for. Although we ideally want the hangar deck rather than the boat bay, because the hangar is bigger and better. <clears throat> so we'll cycle through at five. Okay, boat bay is complete, small boat bay is starting on, so keep going. Okay, 1000 tons added, and visible light laser. So, we'll take our energy weapon, and we'll go for the near ultraviolet laser. 
Now, with the lasers, um, the where is it? The focal size increases the amount of damage that a laser will do at point blank range. It adds range as well, so it does give you maximum range, but the primary purpose of it is to add damage. The laser type, so the frequency, where did it go? There it is. <clears throat> the frequency um, will lose less damage with range. So it adds more, it adds maximum range, but very, very importantly, it will reduce how much the energy drops off. And I'll show you more of that once we actually build the laser, um, because it will become visible in here. So once we actually start the construct, uh, um, look at the laser, um, I'll show you how the damage drops off. But for now, we'll just wait for technology to come through. So we just took five days. Go. Fire control speed rating. Fire control speed rating is extremely important because um, the accuracy of your cannon tire style weapons is determined by the tr by the tracking speed. So um, the fire control has its own tracking speed, and the weapon has its own tracking speed. Um, I'll cover that in detail uh, once we actually start designing the ship. So what did we get this time? We got the speed rating, and that will be here. And there it is. Excellent. And keep going. <clears throat> Okay, shipyard has been upgraded further. That's good. Uh, we got two more research. So tracking speed. Now this is for the turret tracking speed. Um, the better your turret tracking speed, the more efficient um, your turret design will be. So once again. Kate Blackburn, there she is. Cue that up. We want we want it to be at least about four thousand at the moment, so <clears throat> we'll keep going. Uh, spinal mount has commenced, excellent, and capacitor recharge. That's on the power and propulsion, so we'll grab him and we'll get capacitor three. Um, don't don't worry if you're not keeping track of what these technologies are. As we as we actually use them, I'll explain. Uh, more about how they actually work and interact, and I'll explain in more detail about, more importantly, why we are, uh, why I'm actually picking these specific technologies. Um, I'll cover them as well when we actually need them. So, we'll keep going. Keep on spinning. Small boat bay is done. <clears throat> <laughs> Taking a while to get finished. Nothing important is happening. Here we are. So, our first ship is complete. And the Mark Harrison is 80% out. <laughs> Now, we've added it to the shipyard task group. <clears throat> we want to now split it off. So, uh, because we're, bu we're still building a ship into the, into the shipyard task group, and because it is a shipyard task group itself, um, we don't necessarily want it to be trying to run around. So, we will select the ship we want to break off. We'll hit detach, and that will put it in a task group with its own unique name. So we will send this off to do a geo survey. Now, since we are moving, we don't necessarily want to be using five day ticks anymore because we want the ship to be able to go to a, to a rock or an asteroid or planet and then do its survey and then keep moving. If your ticks are too large, then it will potentially move to a planet, sit there, and then not actually start moving to the next one until the next cycle. Um, the five-day order uh, mostly gets around it, 
because it lines up several orders. But if five rocks are in the same place and it surveys all of them in a day and you've done a five day tick, it won't get it won't move on to the next five until that five days is up. So the smaller the increment you can get away with, the better. So uh, we'll st we'll go for one day at the moment. And look at it go. <clears throat> Planets are obviously going to take more survey points to actually complete because it is based off of the total size of the planet. Uh, but these asteroids, as you can see, it's scooting along very, very nicely and just zipping along right along. So it's going to get through very, very nice. The inner system is usually very, very quickly done because it's got a lot of rocks, but it's, they're all very, very close together and not very uh, much distance is required to get to them. Um, once you get out past about Saturn, Saturn Uranus, um, that's when you start to really need that range and that speed. So fire control is done. We will go ahead and get some more. There we are. And we, need, we will need tracking time bonus. Uh, tracking time bonus against missiles. This is um, this is very important if you are using cannon-based point defense. If you're using anti-missile missiles, uh, which we won't be right this very instant. Uh, if you're using anti-missile missiles, then um, it's not too important, but if you're using cannons, it's very important. Um, what basically happens is that if missiles are traveling faster than your uh, final tracking speed, um, then you will take a penalty to your accuracy. So let's say you take a 10% penalty to your accuracy. Um, if you have a tracking, a tracking bonus against missiles of 20%, then it will give you a bonus of up to 20%. It'll increase by 2% every five seconds that you are that you have a missile detected. So once you detect it, every five seconds that will go up by 2%. So after um, what is it? Uh, 50 seconds? No, 25 seconds. After 25 seconds, the tracking bonus will be at 10%, and that will eliminate 10% worth of accuracy penalty. So if we have a penalty of 10% after t after 25 seconds, um, no, yeah, 25 seconds, um, that penalty will no longer exist. And we will have our full accuracy against the missiles, even though they are traveling faster. So um, if your tracking speed is low and, your, and the enemy missiles are fast, you want a good tracking bonus and you want good missile sensors that will see the missiles far enough out that you will be able to get that tracking bonus high enough. Um, you'll see that in action a lot more once we actually get into combat. So we shall move along and continue our survey of Sol. And then in probably a couple of week, couple of game weeks, we should be seeing, ah, there it is, our second survey ship. We'll detach her. Now, <clears throat> with the geo survey, the geo system, uh, ships doing geo and grav surveys in a system will co coordinate with each other. So they will not overlap in surveys, which is very nice. So we shall move along. There they are. There we go. It looks like the inner section is done. <clears throat> so while they do that, what I'll do is I'll just do a little bit of um, rundown of this. So this is the main display. It shows all the basic things like orbital paths, the actual bodies themselves, names of bodies, and um, non-body objects. Uh, the move tail is see the little line that follows the contacts. It tells you how far they have moved in the last increment. That's the move tail. Um, comet paths basically tell you what route comets take in and out of the system. Um, and I'll show that in a sec once you actually get an interrupt. Uh, orbital comparison will drop a circle around the primary star uh, that lines up with the, sh the planet that you select. So for example, you can take Earth orbit and it'll give you an idea of how big the system is compared to Sol. 
in Sol, it really doesn't work because the orbits are, you know, the orbits of the planets we're comparing with. So you can see, or here, you can get multiples of Pluto. So actually, if we do two times Pluto, there you go. See, so Pluto is about there, and twice Pluto is here. So uh, the difference between the Sun and Pluto is there to there and then out again. So you can see that how it basically works. <clears throat> All right, what do we get? A sector command has been completed. Excellent. So we'll go to, oh, we've got some more, oh, we've got some more administrators. So we were going to use Bethany. <clears throat> and that's actually who we're going to have to use. So um, you'll notice here that Earth is A4 and Earth sector is A5. That means that the officer must be at least that rank to take that position. So Bethany is our only rank five administrator, so she's the only one who can be governor of Earth sector. So we'll give her that job. Uh, Weibo van Mulken. Let's see how you compare look, to Evie. So Evie's got 10% shipbuilding, 15% factory. Um, Weibo has 20% shipbuilding, 10% factory. So that's better. So be double the shipbuilding bonus, but uh, a bit less of a factory bonus. He's got much better wealth and a mining bonus. Ooh, he is really good. Evie, I think you might be fired. Sorry. Weber has replaced Evie as governor of Earth. Right then, on to some more happier things. So now that we have our sector command and our uh, planetary governor it have all been organized, uh, we'll do a quick rundown of what we need. We've got 15% unused construction, so we'll throw that into our spaceport. Take a look and... Yes, that's all fine. Perfect. And we shall move on. All right, spinal mount is done. Personally, I'm not that fan of a spinal mount. I like to go straight through to advanced spinal. Um, it is 20,000 points, though, which is rather expensive, but um, it's far superior to spinal in pretty much every way. So we'll cover that once we actually get some more research points. Uh, we'll get the capacitor recharge rate in a second as well. So <clears throat> there we go. It was power propulsion here it is. We'll get it up to four. That's a nice amount. We'll get the efficiency up to four as well. Um, an extra level or two of efficiency is so, so very useful um, because it just allows your jump drive to be so much smaller and then your jump ship can be so much smaller. It can fit so many more things. So it is just extraordinarily useful to have that efficiency. Um, we'll also need some squadron size as well so we can make blockade runs. So we'll move along. <clears throat> it looks like our exploration ships are out in the Kuiper Belt. All right, max engine power modifier is good. We want this to be up higher. The reason why I'm getting these is mainly for when we do actually get uh, missiles. Because you need those modifiers to be able to make missiles that are actually good. <clears throat> Look along.
<laughs> right, so let's... Okay, commercial shipyard is done. Good. Okay, we have 25 spare production. What do we want? We want automated mines. We'll up that to 20. Get them out a bit faster. And uh, we'll bang out this spaceport, get it over and done with, because we're only getting one at the moment. So we got that sorted, and let's move along. Okay, let's go um, body info. We're not, there's nothing there at the moment. All bodies will give you basically all, well, all, a list, a, a, a chart of all the bodies that you've got, that, uh, and, the, and, and the hierarchy. So planets, moons, asteroids, all that stuff. Contacts, um, this will turn civilian transponders on and off, so you don't have to um, use sensors to find them. Um, technically speaking, they're kind of a separate entity from you, but so which is why I can't really control them. But um, yeah, they're, they're a special case. Um, so we want tracking bonus. We want distances. Distances will have a little range ca range counter on uh, hostile contact names that will tell you how far they are from the closest friendly uh, task group. Uh, we'll come back to contacts once we actually have some contacts to work with. Um, now, for display, asteroids and colonies only, I'm not a fan of, but asteroids and minerals only, that's great. Really tidies up your display. Um, don't need anything, any of this more. We definitely want to show life pods. Um, we don't really need fleet coordinates. Don't have to remember that one. Packet contacts. Alright, these are going to be extremely useful. So, max weapon range, max fire control range. And well, if we were using missiles, salvo target will be useful as well. But mainly uh, fire control range and weapon range. This will give you an immediate visual indicator and it will draw a ring around your ships that will tell you how far you can shoot and how far your weapons can hit. Because it's, uh, unless you, you're... Um, unless you organize it really well, they're generally not going to line up perfectly. Um, and especially with uh, cannon-based fire controls, they're not going to line up perfectly. Um, when you're using missiles, especially if your fire control has a longer range than your missiles, you definitely want to have your max weapon range set up uh, because it will draw a ring of about how far your missiles can hit. You don't want to be firing your missiles um, if they're going to run out of fuel well before they actually get there. And a fire control will let you lock onto a target that the missile that's loaded cannot possibly hit. So these two are very important. Um, how much time are we up to? 28 minutes. I'll just run through this real quick and then uh, we'll take a break. So minerals, highlights survey bodies, and it gives you mineral concentrations. Um, we've turned off everything that doesn't have minerals, so kind of pointless. And if you open it up, it's, this will give you everybody that has minerals and how many minerals and their accessibility. So useful, but not as useful as this one because you can't really do much with it. Military will give you a list of task groups and the ships in them and classes. Uh, we've covered this one. Waypoints will like to set waypoints. Um, in space. Waypoints are basically the only way you can really tell a ship to go out in the middle of nowhere and stay there uh, without telling it to fly between two objects and then telling it to stop. It's a lot easier to add waypoints. You can also fire missiles at waypoints directly. Um, so that way, you, for example, if you set a waypoint uh, in front of a hostile contact and drop missiles on top of it, if those missiles have active sensors, they will automatically pick up the um, enemy ships and guide themselves to target. Um, difficult because you basically have to triangulate it yourself and you have to know exactly how far things are going to move, but extremely satisfying when done. Once we start with missiles, might see if we can actually pull it off. And sensors. So active sensor ranges we also want as well so we can see how far our sensors can actually detect. Obviously we don't have any right now, but we will soon. Um, now with these, these two are a very, very important. So passive sensor ranges. Okay, you've got passive sensor range and signature detection range. So to detect signature strength of 648,
Here it is. So a signature strength of 684, we will see at this range. Okay. And a sensor of 494 strength will see this ship's thermal signature at this range. So if you know the sensor strength of the enemy's most powerful sensor, so let's say you know they have an 828 sensor strength uh, uh, strength sensor, you know that your ship has to be out uh, has to be further away from them than this, otherwise they're going to see you. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if you know their uh, their signature, you can park your ship close enough that it can spot them when it comes through. So these two are handy if you know the statistics of the ship that you're working with. If you don't know the rating of the ship, this is not going to do you much good. You can always guess, but um, you're not going to get it. Um, and that covers that. So we're going to take that break now and return, uh, and we'll continue surveying uh, next episode.